Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Refuge Bible Fellowship. Uh, tonight, we will be continuing our study through the book of 1 Samuel. We'll be in chapter 25, but uh, I wanted to uh, welcome uh, and introduce to you a dear friend of ours, Danny Arroyo. Um, he was, just, just to give you a little bit of history about him, uh, he's our special guest worship this evening. And uh, he has this, this studio that normally he records in. He, uh, he's done these live feeds on his Facebook page. Uh, but at the very beginning of Refuge Bible Fellowship, uh, he, uh, he agreed to lead us in worship. And he did so faithfully for the first year. Uh, he's been a dear friend, him and his wife, Kim, and his uh, family. Uh, to Bettina and myself, uh, truly been a blessing and an encouragement to the body of Christ. And so I had asked him if he would be willing to record, and, uh, and he was more than willing. He, was, uh, he made himself available, and, and so he's going to start us off this evening with worship. And so I know you'll be blessed, and so please uh, welcome Danny Arroyo. Hey, good evening, Refuge family, Pastor Rolf, and hope everybody's doing really good. I'm um, blessed to be able to do this and lead you in worship this evening, and... Um, so, well, cool. Well, this is great. God bless you guys. Hope everybody's doing really good. And uh, so just keep your eyes on Jesus and we'll be just right. Right on. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Father God, we just thank you again for another day. Father, we just lift up this time of worship as we invite you as our guest of honor, Father. And we just thank you so much, Father God. Father, calm our spirits. Father, that we can just find ourselves in your presence, Father God, this evening. And so we just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living. Presence, 
Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Refuge family. Good evening once more and welcome to Refuge Bible Fellowship. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, tonight we are continuing our study through the book of 1 Samuel. We are in chapter 25. I know that today marks about the sixth week we've been in quarantine and, uh, and, and really... Uh, you know, as, as much as we've been desiring to come together, uh, I know that the Lord has uh, blessed and has worked through uh, what we've done with social media, through streaming, and uh, all of these different instruments that God is using. He's, he's been using them to reach so many people. So just so you know, um, Sunday morning messages at this point uh, are reaching about 1,100 people, which th those are, that's a lot of uh, people who are being reached uh, with one message. Normally, uh, we are reaching uh, about maybe 150 to 200 people, uh, but uh, here as of late, probably the last few weeks, we've been reaching quite a few. So I would encourage you uh, to share. What you do is after this service, uh, maybe tomorrow on Thursday, um, go to your Facebook page, then go to Refuge Bible Fellowship, go to this message, and click on the share button. When you uh, share it on your page, put on there, just in case you missed our Wednesday night service, here it is. And what that does is it, it exposes the service, the message, to your sphere of influence, your friends. And, uh, and so that gets the gospel out to more and more people. Uh, I'm asking that more of you uh, share these videos so that more people will be impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're, we teach through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And, uh, and so we want to get the word out. We want people to have hope, uh, to not be in despair, but know that there is hope in Jesus Christ, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so I want to encourage you with that. Um, so this evening, again, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 25. We're um, coming up this evening on the story of Abigail Nabal, her wife, her husband, I'm sorry, and um, the, the death of Samuel, and of course, David. And uh, so this chapter... We'll learn about the description of Abigail and Nabal, her husband, and how it is that uh, this man is described. He's, he's quite a character. He's a foolish man is how he's described, who hates to be told anything. He can't be confronted uh, because uh, he's just full of pride and, and arrogance. And so we'll learn about that. He's described as harsh and badly behaved. Uh, quote, such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him, close quote. And his wife, unfortunately, confirmed it all, Abigail. We'll see how she discerns it's necessary to intercede on his behalf to avoid the destruction of the whole family. So let's pray and let's get into our study. First Samuel chapter 25. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given to us to come together to study your word. I ask, Lord, that uh, you would give us understanding, that you would speak to us individually, and that you would be honored and glorified. And we commit this time into your hands, Lord, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So 1 1 Samuel chapter 25 and beginning in verse 1. Now Samuel died and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him in his house at Ramah. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And so we begin this chapter with the death of Samuel. While David was in the southern region of Israel, his dear friend and spiritual counselor, Samuel, had died. He had, he had uh, perished, and so uh, the, whole, the whole country mourned for him. Samuel's death meant the loss of a national resource, an intercessor, and marked the end of an era of Israelite, in Israelite history. Uh, appropriately, all Israel mourned his death and gave him an honorable burial in his hometown of Ramah. David at that point, so we, we finish off uh, that time that in, in, in Israel's history of Samuel and all his impact. He had such a great impact and no doubt that he, his impact will continue to resonate in the life of David and many of the people that he came in contact with and ministered to. But at that point, we move on, and David moved on. From En Gedi, he moved south to the wilderness of Paran. This would be considered the most isolated location within David's homeland in Judah as he continued to hide from Saul. Verse 2 says, And there was a man in Mon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. And now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. So now we're introduced to a couple by the name of Nabal and Abigail. And Nabal was from a place called Mon, and he was very rich. He's described as having 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. So this gives a pretty good description of just how wealthy he was. Later on, we're going to see uh, even further evidence of their wealth. But <clears throat> just to give you an idea, idea geographically uh, of this, the area in Israel that we're talking about, um, we have the Dead Sea, we have En Gedi, which is just west of the Dead Sea, and then west from there in south a little bit, we have the area of Carmel and Mon, and Mon is a little bit further south from there. So we have Carmel and Gedi, and we have Mon. Um, This man was from Mon, and so he had business in Carmel. He was having his sheep sheared, and... um, and this was where this is all located, this whole story. Well, actually, uh, the part of it where David sends his men to meet up with the man Nabal. Nabal is described as being a Calebite, which means that he comes from a re- well-respected clan, a well-respected family, an esteemed family that was responsible for founding uh, David's hometown of Bethlehem. Although the family was esteemed, in fact, if you look back at, uh, at Caleb, Caleb, uh, although he was an old man, he, was, uh, he had um, just a, a, a lot of strength. And, and, uh, and he, I remember him asking Joshua to give him the hill country. Uh, perhaps he could take on the Philistines. He just felt like he was strong enough to do that. So, uh, so this man, Nabal, was of that family. So it was a very honorable family. But although the family was esteemed and honorable, Nabal was not. Uh, Being further described as a man that was harsh and badly behaved. In fact, the name itself, Nabal, means foolish. On the other hand, Abigail, his wife, was described as simply being discerning and beautiful. So here we have Nabal, his very name means foolish. And then in contrast, we have his wife, Abigail, who is discerning and beautiful. Quite a contrast, discerning, because foolishness is a man who lacks discernment, who does not know how to respond in a manner that is fitting for someone who would would express uh, maturity. And so 
we have her described in that way, discerning and beautiful, and he was uh, undiscerning and he was foolish. Proverbs 18.15 says, An intelligent heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Another word for intelligent in Proverbs 18.15 is discerning. So a discerning heart acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Hebrews 5.14 says, But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And we'll see how this works out for each one as we continue with their story. One a fool and the other one being described as discerning. Verse 4. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. And so David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shears. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm. And they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at hand to your servants and to your son, David. We see here that the reason why David had sent men to Carmel to meet up with Nabal was because he had need for his men. Uh, he was, uh, Nabal was financially able to help. Uh, he had an abundance of well, resources at his disposal. And so uh, David had need as far as him and his 600 men, and he sent 10 to ask for help. Notice how it was that he referred uh, to himself and the men that were with him. He uh, considered himself servants of Nabal and even called himself a, a son of Nabal. In other words, he was coming in humility and in peace to this man, Nabal. In previous days, and just to give you a little bit of, of a background, what he was saying there was that Nabal's shepherds uh, were, were uh, taking care of the flocks, were taking care of Nabal's flocks, and, but they were well taken care of, not because of what they could do for themselves, but because of David's men. Later on, we'll see how it is that they're described as, man, they were like a wall around us. Nobody can get through them. And so they were well taken care of, protected by David's men. And um, so what, what we know about that time is that the Philistines were raiding, they were uh, plundering, um, they, were, they were coming and just taking everything from everyone. And so David and his men were, had protected Nabal's young men who were his servants and protected uh, not only the shepherds but their flocks as they were out in the field. So David, as we see here, was gentle in his approach. He was very careful. He was very humble as he approached. He didn't demand. He offered proof by the testimony of Nabal's own servants, his own young men, as, he, as they're described here, who did receive personally David's protection. And he only asked for whatever Nabal felt like providing for them. He didn't demand a specific amount. Um, he only asked whatever it was that Nabal uh, was willing to give. And so he, again, came to him humbly. He came to him gently, very carefully. He didn't come demanding anything, but spoke to him gently through these ten men that David sent his way. Now, this was supposed to be, and this is something that Nabal knew, and this is something that David knew. Uh, the time of the festival and the time of shear, shearing normally happened in the springtime and in early fall, so two times a year. And it was, it was a, normally a time to where uh, there was much generosity that was demonstrating, demonstrated toward each other. And so we, we have this, and David knew, Nabal knew, and, um, it, and it's interesting how David sent his men greeting, uh, beginning with a desire for peace for Nabal. So he came again very gently, but also reminding Nabal that this was a, this was a time for being generous. And so uh, he sent these men to ask simply for what they needed, not, not for anything more. But David did send a greeting at the very beginning. 
and he, because he desired peace for Nabal, for his home, and for all of his possessions. And it's interesting because David actually participated in ensuring peace to Nabal previously as he protected his men and his flock. So David had already participated in the peace that Nabal was enjoying by protecting his men and uh, in all of his flocks that he had in that area. So let's continue. In verse 9, it says, When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men who come from I do not know where? Really, this response of Nabal demonstrated a lack of discernment, a lack of wisdom, a lack of uh, just uh, an awareness. It was a reflection of foolishness. His very name, Nabal, insulted David. Basically, what he was saying is, you are no one to me. Who do you think you are? And so he was very insulting. Uh, he was condescending. And not only that, but Nabal was accusing David of being a rebellious servant of Saul, not having all the details, not understanding the situation and the relationship between Saul and David, but he was accusing him of being a re rebellious servant of Saul. Uh, we need to be careful that when we only know part of the story, that we do not cast judgment on someone for perhaps doing something that we really don't have a good understanding uh, of. And so that was the case with Nabal. He spoke too soon. You know, he, he said something that he shouldn't have said because it lacked understanding and it definitely lacked knowledge because he accused David of being a rebellious servant of Saul, one who turned from following and honoring the king. But we know that that was not the case. We know the truth of the matter and the details surrounding the situation. Now, Nabal continued his insult saying he doesn't even know where these men came from. Nabal basically said he doesn't know who they really are. Can they really be trusted is what he was saying. Because I don't really know, really know if uh, what they're telling me is even true. This was all... Because he knew. He knew, who, he knew who David was. He knew who these men were. And yet he was, he was playing this card. And he was, this was all a display of his arrogance, extreme pride, and a condescending attitude. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In the case of Nabal, is destruction and fall is coming. Now, a word of warning. A word of warning for us, because too many people seem to be blind to their own pride, but somehow detect that pride in other people. They're very quick to point a finger, whereas they themselves uh, perhaps are full of pride, uh, being self-centered, and, uh, and perhaps even arrogance. <clears throat> but at some point, we know that their pride will be revealed for what it is. And will prove to be destructive and will lead to their fall if not repented of. The thing with pride is that that is not the unforgivable sin. Pride is something that we can repent of. You know, if we have uh, that brought to our attention that we're full of pride, arrogance, we're self-centered, um, then at that point we should really allow the Lord and ask the Lord to examine our hearts and to see if that's really true. Perhaps it is. And we should be humble enough to acknowledge perhaps even the slightest bit of pride in our lives because that is, is something that is, <clears throat> is unbecoming of a Christian. A, a Christian ought to be humble and esteem others above ourselves. We should value others. We should look to others. We should serve others. We should be other-centered. And so pride is something that, if it's brought to our attention, that we, we shouldn't close our eyes uh, and stop listening. We should actually 
heed that warning and ask the Lord to reveal it to us. And that's something that we can repent of. And we ought to be re more re uh, repentful of, uh, of that pride that perhaps we've come to realize we are in possession of. That we ought to give over right away. But so just a word of warning. Um, and, and how do I know? How do I know that pride at some point will be revealed and pride, if not repented of, will lead to a fall? Well, I know this to be sure. It is certain that this will take place. Why? Because God says so. It's his promise and God is faithful. His word is true. The fall and destruction may be in the form of relational, professional, and financial consequences. But all of it really is spiritual in the deepest sense. It's just the consequences can come in, in, in those areas of our lives. But rest assured that a fall and destruction will come to the person who does not repent of their pride. Because God, God's word says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So that's why he said, if you humble yourself before the Lord, he says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so that haughty spirit, that arrogance, we have to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you, he may lift you up. Verse 12, let's continue. It says, So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them, and every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. And so the 200 re remained back at camp. They were the reinforcements. They took care of everything back uh, at camp, while 400 of them made preparations, including David, to go after Nabal. Wow, what a response. David had initially sent 10 men to humbly ask for some help, and now he's getting ready with 400 of his best men to go and take care of Nabal. Uh, he, was, uh, he was insulted, he was uh, belittled, he was rejected, and um, so he was, he was going to go immediately to go respond to Nabal. He, he didn't respond anywhere close to this, though, with King Saul. So there's a, a contrast here between the way he responded to, and he has been responding to King Saul, and how he responded at this point to Nabal. Now, is this kind of a response justified? And that is something that we ought to ask because he seems to think that this kind of a response is justified. He immediately popped up, strapped on his, uh, his, all his gear, you could say, his sword, let's go, men, let's go, we're going after him. And that's what he was saying. So is, is this justified? Saul, keep in mind, had attempted to kill him personally three times with his own spear. He had put a hit out on his life, and he had pursued him time and time again with murderous intentions. But Nabal, he insults David, and he's ready to stomp on him. Whereas with King Saul, remember that he was in the cave, how he took off a corner of his garment. He was deeply convicted as soon as he did that, and, and he humbled himself before the king. And made his case saying he had had no ill intentions toward him. None whatsoever. And yet here was Nabal that insulted David. And he was ready to stomp on him. Really, it, it hardly seems appropriate. And the reason why it hardly seems appropriate is because in reality, it wasn't. Although David was a man after God's own heart, he was not a perfect man. This is, I believe, a good lesson for us, that as we, 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 are, we have the, um, really the benefit of kind of sitting back and seeing how all of this plays out. 
Here we have this man, David, who is jumping to take this man out and immediately reacts in this manner. And yet he is a man who will see later on responds when someone confronts him with this issue. He reasons. And, and that's why I believe he was considered to be by God a man after God's own heart. It was because he realized that he wasn't perfect and he always cried out to the Lord. He confessed his sins. He humbled himself before God and he asked for forgiveness. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. This whole reaction by David, of course, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem appropriate and it, and it isn't appropriate. It's not fitting. But it seems like the same behavior that is seen uh, but it seems like it, it's the same behavior that's seen every day for us. It, it's something that is, is normal, not right, but something that we see all the time. People give a pass to those who have some authority or can serve to benefit them, while others who are subordinate or someone who is, is no one that, um, uh, to them, you know, as far as any kind of influence is concerned, um, are judged and treated harshly, perhaps a little bit more than than others who can benefit them or, or are in a place of authority. Romans 2.11, let's look at God's character to see how it is that he would respond in any given situation because he is consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so according to Romans 2.11, says, for God shows no partiality, no partiality. He plays no favorites. His word is the same and applies the same across the board to everyone. And so we can look to scripture for that. Jesus taught differently, the son of God. He taught differently in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. I want to take you there. It says there in regards to uh, revenge, to retaliation. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. It says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Verse 43 you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So perfect as in sinless, no, always striving for maturity in the truth? Yes. And so I believe we're tested all the time. I think we're being tested right now to exercise those very verses right there. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 48, I believe we're being tested right now in so many different ways. But that's to show for us how it is that we are to respond. And so Jesus taught that. Now, is it true? Does it apply at all times? I would think so. At least for the believer, the one who wants to glorify the Lord. And uh, so we see that. And, and uh, so Jesus taught differently. Um, Romans 2.11 says that God shows no partiality. And so we ought to treat everyone the same. But David responded, responded in this manner to Nabal, and he got all his men ready. Let's see what happens here. Continu continuing on in verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master. And he railed at them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the fields as long as we went with them. 
They were a wall to us both by night and by day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his house. And he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. Wow. One of Nabal's servants came to Nabal's wife, Abigail, to tell her everything that was going on. And the question is why? Why would one of Nabal's servants go to his wife, Abigail, and not to him? Well, we have the answer to that at the very end of that section of Scripture. And that is because his, Nabal's character was very well known. Uh, he was a man who could not be told anything. In other words, no one could tell Nabal that he was wrong. Uh, this servant confirmed that they had been taken care of and protected by David and his men. That was the same thing that David had told Nabal through the mouth of his ten messengers, as they came, his ten servants, as, as they, they came to uh, Nabal. And so it was confirmed by this one servant that came and spoke to Abigail and told her, Hey, listen, they took good care of us. We were well treated. And, um, but we know at this time that harm was coming to Nabal and his whole household. And so, so, th so this word of warning came to Abigail, and this, this servant of Nabal came to her to tell her everything that was going on. Uh, pretty much what he was saying is that it was worthless to go to Nabal. He wouldn't get anywhere with him. He wouldn't listen. But perhaps Abigail uh, will listen, and she'll know what to do. So the choice was in her hands. She could discern one way or the other as far as what it was that she was to do. Proverbs 18, 1 and 2 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. And it's, it sounds, those two verses of Proverbs 18, verses 1 and 2, seem to describe this man, Nabal. A man who isolated himself, uh, he broke out against all sound judgment. He takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expresses his own opinion. We got to be careful to not be in a ball, to not be that person who disregards sound judgment, uh, who isolates himself and keeps to himself and really is all about his own opinion and uh, finds no pleasure in understanding. That is described by the Bible as a man or a woman who is foolish and lacks discernment. So that's why the servant went to Abigail and not to Nabal, because it would have been a waste of his time. His character was known. Verse 18, as we continue, says, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five seas of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. And as she rode on the donkey and came down under the cover of the mountain, behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he was returned. He has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him." So just as David was coming to destroy Nabal and his household, Abigail was making ready to go to David to meet him with these gifts to demonstrate her humility and really a plea for mercy on behalf of her husband and the whole household. She was coming to plead for mercy as David was coming toward them to absolutely destroy them. At least she was going to be heard by David. As she gathers all of these resources, all of these gifts, you could see that she did it in short order. So this is further evidence of their wealth. Not only did they have 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, but they had all of this at their disposal, something that Nabal could have very easily put together and given to David's men upon request, even a small portion of it. And yet he failed to do, do that. Uh, he, he rejected um, David and his men. But this man, Nabal and Abigail, they were a wealthy family. And it took them very little time to gather up all of these gifts uh, to bring with 
Abigail to come meet David and offer these things to him. Just a, a plea for, for mercy from David. Now, David, as he said these things, was he was correct in stating these facts, but he wasn't right in what he was doing. So he was right in his facts, but he was wrong in what he was actually doing, what he was about to carry out. He was about to completely wipe out Nabal and his family, all of his servants and all that he owned. Keep in mind that Nabal was the one that had insulted him. It wasn't the rest of the family, but David was ready to wipe everyone out, every single person. And everyone was expecting it but Nabal. Verse 17, this servant came and they were all expecting. He says, now therefore know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all his house. And he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. So everyone was expecting this except for Nabal. The blind fool didn't see destruction coming. The blind fool will never see destruction coming. And that's why... Pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Why? Because there's blinders. And a person all of a sudden, out of seems like out of nowhere, will fall into a ditch and hurt himself and perhaps many others because of his fall. And it's because pride blinds the undiscerning. It, pride blinds the fool. And so a blind fool doesn't see destruction coming. Verse 23, let's continue. It says, when Abigail, and this is Abigail's uh, plea with David. Now she's come and, and, and made contact with David. And so verse 23 says, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant let not my Lord regard his worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, or foolish, or, or fool. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself." And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. Oh, what a plea. What a plea from Abigail. Abigail humbly approached David, who was ready to destroy Nabal and everyone in his household. So just imagine this. David is coming with his 400 men, and here comes this, this entourage of, of gifts, one after one donkey after another. Uh, animals of burden, and they were coming with all of these gifts for David. And then following all of these gifts was Abigail, beautiful and discerning, coming to intercede on behalf of her husband and all of the people. She was confessing. She pleaded for mercy. She confessed uh, the sin, acknowledging David's future reign and pledging her allegiance and loyalty to the one whom she knew was anointed and had been promised the throne, succeeding King Saul. Abigail humbled herself before David. She didn't come prideful to demand that David cease and desist in pursuing Nabal and, and destroying everyone. She didn't do that. Yes, she was beautiful, she was rich, and she was privileged, I'm sure, because with all of that uh, wealth and the family and power comes comes all of that 
to some degree. But she didn't come across like an arrogant, rich person who feels entitled. She didn't present herself like that at all. Not at the least. In fact, she humbled herself. She confessed that sin. And she pleaded for mercy. She looked to David actually as her superior. And she as his humble servant. She bowed in humility and reverence. She requested to speak and be heard. She didn't just demand to be heard. But she humbly requested to speak and to be heard. She confessed and took responsibility for her husband's sin. She anticipated David's reasoning and asked that David's true enemies be destroyed as David was planning to do, uh, to, uh, as David was planning to destroy Nabal. She desired blessings upon David. She acknowledged the Lord's anointing on David. She asked to be remembered when David's conscience realized realizes that Abigail stopped him from shedding blood without cause. But was this all the right thing to do? And that's that's a question. Now, all of these things that I have just described is really, it sounds like Abigail just did everything right. She was very discerning and she, she, she was wonderful when she approached David with all of these things. After all, she prevented David from continue, continuing on in having a blemish in his conscience of shedding blood without cause, shedding innocent blood. But the question with all of this is also, was this the right thing to do? Yes, her husband was a fool. He was described in that way. His character, this is how his character was, was known throughout. But here's some things to also consider. She didn't go to her husband to talk to him and make every attempt to convince him that destruction was right around the corner. Should she have? This is the part that perhaps she could have decided at at that very moment. She could discern, have discerned, and have gone to her husband. She should have, even if he wouldn't have listened. The other thing that she did was she openly criticized her husband, not something we should ever do to our spouse. She implied that her husband may be the guilty party, but no one else. She said, take him out, pretty much, but not us. She made herself available to David in the future, perhaps when he was king. Remember me, your servant. Abigail, you see, was discerning, but she could have done this differently without throwing her husband, really at this point, under the bus. But Abigail did turn David's focus from Nabal Remember, he was focused. He was, he was going to destroy Nabal and his whole, whole household. And Abigail did succeed in turning David's focus from Nabal back to the Lord. But Abigail's intentions were good. Her speech toward David was uplifting with humility and respect. And the things she said were truthful. You see, there is this middle ground that ought to be found. There are some spouses that are just like Nabal, and there are two responses to these types, uh, to this type of a spouse. There is number one, silent submission. Hey, I'll just do whatever they want me to do to keep the peace in the home. Happy spouse, happy house. Secondly, outspoken opponent. This is the one who just speaks their mind. I really don't care. I know my spouse is wrong and I'm going to make sure he knows it or she knows it and everyone else too. I'm here to make my spouse wholly not happy. You've heard that too. That, uh, that our wife or, or our husband, you know, is, is there, we're there to make them wholly not happy after all, right? Well, that's the other extreme. Because as I speak my mind, I want a holy spouse, not a mouse. Right? I, I want my, my spouse to be a, a certain way. Well, we need to find a way to win them over. Be open, be gentle, and be truthful, yes, but be gentle and find a way. For Abigail, she very could well have gone to her husband, even though he was known to possess this character of not being able to be spoken to. And And she could have made every effort, just as she did with David, to go and convince him otherwise. But she didn't do that. Her first inclination was to go to David. Now, again, to her credit, 
she succeeded in turning his focus from Nabal back to the Lord. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, truly by morning there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. Then David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice and I have granted your petition. So David received Abigail's gift and um, what she had, uh, had to say also. So he, he, he obeyed that voice. He reasoned, he listened, and even thanked her for keeping him from shedding innocent blood unnecessarily. David reasoned and acknowledged his error when confronted said she was exercising good discretion. In other words, Abigail had kept David back from sinning. And so David acknowledged that, and he repented. And, and he acknowledged the fact that Abigail had brought him to his senses and prevented him from shedding innocent blood. Now, Proverbs 1.5 says, Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. Verse 36 and Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning light. In the morning, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And about ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. Now, Nabal, as we see, as we continue to see here, was oblivious to the destruction that was just around the corner. He certainly lived up to his name. These verses tell us that although David had relented from his pursuit of Nabal's life, God did not. And he had this judgment lined up for him. Now, Nabal at this time was parting like as if there, was, there were no worries at all. Even though destruction, again, was right around the corner. David very well, very well could have come up on Nabal and his, his whole household and completely wiped him out. All of his servants knew, and now his wife knew. Had she not done anything, perhaps destruction would have come. But he was partying. He was so drunk that she discerned to just not say anything until the morning she did. And when she did, his heart became like a stone. And he basically died at that point, and judgment came. Now, David did not have to seek revenge. And this judgment was accurate. It was, it was lasered into Nabal. And it was brought on him. It, God's judgment is perfect. And whether he applies mercy or judgment, that is solely up to him. It's not up to us. We need to leave those things to God. Leave them in God's hands. And he, let him do what he may. As for us, we ought to be very mindful of how we respond to certain situations that we wouldn't be found in sin. Why? Because we could be tempted as we seek to restore. As it says in Galatians, I believe, 6, um, six we see how it is that we are to restore our brothers, but then we are to be mindful of ourselves lest we be tempted also. And so we can be tempted not only by their sin, but also by our reaction to their reaction. And, uh, and so for us, vengeance is mine is what the Lord says. In other words, vengeance is not ours. And we need to be very careful as to how we react, how we respond to others and, uh, and what they do and not do. Because we have to take care of and protect our hearts and our minds so that we may bring glory to the Lord and not shame. Verse 39, as we wrap up, says, When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they said to her, David has sent us to you to take you to him as his wife. And she rose and bowed her with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hurried and rose and mounted a donkey, and her five young women attended her. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam 
of, of Jezreel, and both of them became his wives. Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was of Galim. So, as we see here, in closing, David acknowledged that God had avenged the insult, and it was God that had held his hand back from sinning. So he acknowledged that. Again, this is, this is an example of a man after God's own heart, a man who brought glory to the Lord, a man who wasn't perfect, but sung God's praises. We see the psalm. He was a psalmist. He was a great psalmist. And so um, he was a man who was very much uh, in an intimate relationship with the Lord. And so as he was close to the Lord, he recognized these things, that it was God who had avenged him and God who also had kept his hand back from sinning, from shedding innocent blood. Now, we know that David had taken an interest in Abigail, and it's uh, obvious as he sent for her after he heard of Nabal's death. Uh, Michael uh, was referenced to, but Michael at this point was not his wife as he took on Abigail as his wife because Saul had taken her back and given her to another. We know that from what we've studied in the past here in this book. Uh, now, Abigail did express her humility as the, the servants came to her and, and gave her this word uh, as David sent for her hand in marriage, and she humbled herself. She wasn't one again that was expressing any pride or arrogance, self-centeredness, but she was willing to, and she got down as a servant, taking the lowliest of places and washing the feet of David's servants. Certainly a humble Person. And so Abigail accepted the re request to be David's wife, taking five of her maidservants along with her and going to David with his servants. We also have a note here that David married another woman by the name of Ahinoam. These, unfortunately, would be the first of many wives that David took to himself. Uh, now, was it, was it sinful to do this? Uh, well, it certainly wasn't the right thing to do. It may have been culturally acceptable, but was it the right thing to do? And the answer to, to that is no. We can go back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, and know that uh, marriage was to be between a man and a woman, singular, one man, one woman. And even from then, that is how God has designed marriage to be. So, of course, this is not what God had commanded a marriage to be. And we all know by what Scripture tells us that David's family was always dealing with turmoil, never at peace, and always dealing with these great trials within his own family. And so David's family was not blessed, was not at peace, was always in some kind of a, a trial, turmoil uh, within it. Now, just in closing... The fool, the discerning, and a repentant sinner. We see all of these. None of these were perfect, but there was that which is right and that which is wrong in the sight of God. That's what we ought to pay attention to. There are so many lessons that we can learn, that we can really pull from and apply to our own lives through what we just read and studied. And I pray that you may have increased discernment as you read the Word of God and understand how to apply it to your situations in life, um, the things that we are confronted with day in and day out. As we get to know God's Word, uh, we are able to discern how to maneuver through those situations in a way that brings glory to God and expresses wisdom, that is, rightly applied knowledge, rightly applied truth, the Word of God. And so I pray that you have more discernment in being able to differentiate, differentiate between good and evil according to your knowledge of God's Word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for these examples, for they serve to benefit us. Oh, such wonderful stories. Lord, uh, they're not, they, they have nothing to do with perfect people. They have to do with the perfect God. And through this, Father, we are, we are better, we are blessed because of your goodness, because of your righteousness, your holiness. And I pray that we 
would realize and acknowledge the love that you demonstrated to us through Jesus Christ, giving us access not only to the throne room of mercy, but Lord, having the hope of eternal life in your glory. And so, Father, thank you for this time in your word. We ask that it would resonate in our hearts to your glory. We thank you, Father, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.